All right, guys, in this video, I'm going to show you how I waterproofed this 2006 um, Grizzly 450. This will work on any Grizzly 450 or the Kodiak 450. Um, if you have a fuel-injected one, the newer Kodiak, yeah, you don't have to worry about the carburetor vents. Otherwise, same process. I'm going to do a complete walkthrough, and then I'm going to repeat it at the end, um, just because I know people are going to ask a lot of questions. So if you didn't get it the first time, Watch the end of the video, it repeats, and it might cover something that you missed or I didn't say in the first one. So the video is really not as long as it looks. It just has it in there twice to try to be thorough. Because every time I make these snorkel videos, I get so many damn questions. So hope this helps you guys out. Um, bike did great. I got a bunch of extra footage. I need to edit from Holopal, but it went very deep, and it did very well. The front hood is off now, just so I can keep an eye on the vent lines and stuff for testing. Um, but eventually, yeah, I'll cut holes in it so it doesn't look that bad. But um, this rack's really bent up, and these three snorkels are really ugly, but they are watertight. I just put it in the pond for several minutes. Belt was bone dry, and I hadn't had to take the cover off and reseal it or anything like that, so good job, Yamaha. Um, belt was bone dry, had like a couple drops in the air box. Um, about a million people have asked for a snorkel video on it, so I'm going to run over the snorkel real quick. Um, obviously, the update will be for the back of this pipe right here, the belt exhaust. Don't make a big loop. Um, use two PVC smooth 90s to make a 180 out of PVC and then hook your pipe to that. Um, but other than that, everything else should be the same. Um, so we'll start with the engine intake. Here's your air box. Factory engine intake's right there. One and a half inch coupler stretches right over it. Put the hose clamp all the way at the bottom of the coupler, not in the groove, because it's only, you know, there's only a lip that's about that high. Um, I also put some ultra black there survived all day yesterday with this thing getting yanked on so it's good to go um, This is just a flexible piece of really cheap spa tubing, um, but I like it because it bends really easy um, In order to adapt this spa tubing to the two uh, excuse me to the one and a half inch coupler I wrapped uh, I filled the grooves with um, Ultra black and I wrapped it with duct tape a few times and then it fits in there really tight and it's very sealed so um, that's some tape and some ultra black to make it make the outside of that flat duct tape um, This is actually a piece of the Grom snorkel and that slides into a two inch coupler or one and a half inch coupler That sits on top of the air box lid, which I just found finally um, So that's really straightforward. I also put some ultra black down in there to help that not pop off Because um, you it really isn't that deep, right? You can't get You can't get the, that much bite on it. So you see where the hose clamp is, but that's pretty good that just comes up here and runs up to here. Now everyone's gonna say, oh, that looks ghetto. I don't wanna do that on my bike. Is there another option? Yes, there is. You can try to do some kind of a 90 and run it right here and then come up. I don't like my intake near my exhaust for a lot of different reasons, but mostly you're eventually gonna have a melt or a rub through. And uh, this way I can see the entire pipe. Um, I was worried that it, this engine wouldn't run great. This is really only like one and a quarter inch inner diameter here. Um, it might mess with, I thought it might mess with the carburetor tuning. It ran fine with that little amount of pipe. It's only a two valve or cylinder motor. So turns out that's just, that's actually enough airflow. Also running it this way makes the pipe a little shorter. So that's probably how I'm gonna leave it. It's working fine. So that's engine intake. Now you have your belt intake and your belt exhaust. Belt intake is the easiest one. It's super easy. There's, there's a, a white claw down here and uh, some kind of plant. Um, there's a little nipple that comes up right here from the factory. From the factory intake all you do is you put a two and a half inch coupler on it or excuse me a two by two so that's a one and a half for the engine intake two inch for the belt intake and again put your clamp at the very bottom of the coupler not in the groove where it would usually go put some ultra black on that two inch piece of pvc pipe two hose clamps to the rack it's on there pretty good and that's it you're done let me show you where that actually goes so the factory belt breather is this big black pipe right here you see where it goes up that's where we hooked to it then it goes down here and it connects to the front of the engine on that little clamp you see in the center of the screen there. I say the engine and not the belt box because this thing you know, has an aluminum belt box on the back half of it. So you're actually connecting to the crankcase uh, with your belt intake and exhaust. Okay, so that's belt intake. That was really easy. Um, belt exhaust, huge pain in the ass. So we'll start up here for this guy. This elbow just pushes the exhaust out of my face a little bit. Um, you can do whatever you want there. And then it comes down through here right behind the radiator. Make sure you put a zip tie right there to keep it from pinching your radiator overflow hose. That's important. Then it comes down between the shock and the frame, right on top of the upper control arm, right behind the coolant tank, and then it goes down here behind the footwell. It is really tight um, to get it to fit through there, but that's why I use this heavy duty green pipe and not the thin stuff I use for the engine intake. 
So it comes all the way down through there, much like a Polaris 850 high lifter, if you know what I'm talking about there. It comes out back here, um, then comes up. I got a couple zip ties to hold it off the upper control arm. Um, then right here is where I'm gonna have two one and a half inch PVC 90s um, hooked together to make a 180 so it doesn't get collapsed like that. So just imagine that there's a U there made out of PVC. I'm just gonna cut here and cut there and stick it in there. Um, and then it comes in to the back of the motor exhaust. So you see that that's the factory boot there on the back of the motor. Um, what fit really well there is a 15 degree um, one and a half inch fitting. And then in that is a one and a half inch pipe and the green pipe slips right into that PVC uh, really tight. And I also put ultra black to make sure it's really watertight. But there's a good shot of what's going on there. Um, that worked well all day. So I think it's safe to say that's the way to do it. Um, very secure. Obviously, because I'm replacing this pipe back here, I could have just gone one and a half inch PVC into that black coupler. Um, make sure you use thin wall one and a half inch though. So this, this will show you actually, this is the same stuff. So this thin wall um, fits really nice over this pipe. So you put a little bit of ultra black there and that's a really good seal. So I'll probably do a similar thing when I make my, my U in the back. As far as sealing the belt box, I didn't touch it. The gaskets on here are really good. This thing spent a lot of time underwater. Belt never got wet. Another thing you're gonna to wanna to do is the air box drain down here. You can kind of see the clamps at the very bottom of the air box. I ran it out to here with a little plug on it so I could easily check my air box. Um, the air box is not super great. The gasket here isn't amazing. Um, so I got a little bit of water in there. So every time I drain it, a few drops will come out, but really it's, it's acceptable. Um, so that's a good mod. Now we need to talk about vent lines. This thing has a lot of vent lines. You've got rear diff, carburetor breather, carburetor drain, coolant tank, fan, front diff, gas tank. So there's a bunch of them. So I'm gonna start with them in groups. So we'll talk about the ones that are related to fuel first. Obviously here's your gas tank breather. Um, and I've got it come up here and it's teed into this line, which is your carburetor breather. Um, the carburetor breather is the one that's on the top of the carb right here. So that's the factory hose and it just comes into this clear hose. Only reason I use clear is so I can see if I get water droplets in it. Um, so there's that one. The bottom carburetor vent is your drain. You want to keep that plugged most of the time because water will come up in there and get in your bowl. Um, and then every once in a while I would just check this to drain it, um, see if anything was overflowing, but just basically put a cap on that. Um, so those are your fuel vents. So because the gas tank is fuel and the carburetor is fuel. I have those teed together, going up the snorkel, breathing out of the same breather. Okay, now there's your oil vents, I'll call them. So your differentials, you got your rear differential and your front differential. Um, this is your rear diff right here. This is the factory line. It was just tucked under the gas tank. You can trace that goes all the way back to the rear differential. Same thing with the front differential. You can trace that right there. You see it coming off the front of the diff or right in the center of the screen. That comes up and both of those come into a T right here and go up the snorkel. Now I also have a third one on here. This clear, this clear line is, this one way, way back here. This is the fan breather for the fan motor. So I went ahead and teed all three of those together because you can mix, you know, that kind of stuff. You don't want to have your gas fumes going into your gear oil though, that's very bad. Okay, so there's all the snorkels except for the coolant overflow. I left that in the factory location. So from the factory, you see there's these three holes here. One, two, three. Um, I left that in the factory location, coolant overflow because if you overheat, you don't want the coolant to spray onto your body and burn your face. So it'll, I'll see the steam come out of here and that's fine. Also, if you go underwater and get a little bit of water in your coolant, coolant's mostly water anyway, so who cares? That goes down to the coolant tank down here. Um, that cap doesn't feel super premium either. But that's the overflow right there, you can see the line. So that's everything you gotta check as far as snorkeling it. You also wanna make sure your crankcase breather is connected properly. So it goes from the top of the cylinder head here. It's this big hose and it goes into the air box. So if you ever pull your air box or anything like that, make sure you hook that hose back up. Otherwise you'll have a very bad day. Um, of course, after you snorkel it, go test it. Check your oil a few times. Your oil's behind this cover here. I left that cover off because I just don't like extra covers. I'm gonna be able to get to things and see things and hear things. So let's see if my oil got milky after all the abuse yesterday. Nope, it did not. This is one of the few bikes yesterday that did not get sunk. Um, I'm literally, everything got flipped over underwater, as you will see in the video. I think I got most of it on film. Um, stuff also caught on fire yesterday. It was complete madness and pandemonium. Um, that's about it. There's another breather right here 
that comes off the side of the intake boot to the top of the carburetor, make sure that's connected. That's what operates the vacuum slide on the carburetor. I usually hate vacuum slide carburetors, but this thing worked awesome, so I'm gonna leave it alone. Um, accelerator pump would be nice for a little bit more better throttle response, but it was really adequate. So modifications I wanna do next, I wanna put some longer front shocks because the front, I suspect, can uh, get some more angle out of those CVs. I don't think I can do much in the rear, but I might put some better rear shocks with some more dampening. But honestly, it rides pretty good considering how little suspension travel it has. So those front shocks are aftermarket Broncos. They're pretty new. And they are adjustable preload, which is great. I love that. Uh, however, they're just too short. So I'm gonna put some longer shocks in the front. I've got a big selection of shocks up there from other four-wheelers I can try out on it. And then obviously I'm gonna put the Rhino 450 transmission gears in it to make it more of a tank. Um, low range was great on 28. I wouldn't go anything over 20 inch Aztec on this thing without doing a gear reduction. Uh, mostly because reverse it can barely turn the tires in reverse in any kind of mud um, so this is this is a maxed out setup right now once i do the 33 um, internal gear reduction um, that's a reduction that will affect high low and reverse um, because it's the the middle drive ratio they call it um, once i do that i'm pretty sure i could turn a 32 aztec what i really want to try to run is these 33 inch aztecs the problem is there's not a whole lot of fender clearance on this thing um, the way the floorboards are so i'd have to pretty much cut all the plastics off to make that happen but it's already hideous so who cares right just keep cutting but i mean overall really impressed with this little honey badger um the front diff lock system four wheel drive diff lock works excellent my favorite setup out, out there um it doesn't have a temperature display like it doesn't show you degrees but it does have a coolant light and the light never came on i also never heard the fan kick on so i'm going to wire up a switch to have a fan override just to keep the fan on more often and keep it a little cooler but it never overheated. I never saw coolant percolating out of it, which is amazing because, you know, I was just beating the crap out of it. Um, you do have a lot of heat that flows out of this side on your leg because the header's right there. So I'm going to probably get that piece of plastic that's missing just to deflect some of that heat out the back of the bike and not across your leg. But otherwise, very happy with this buy. Um, definitely the most fun you can have at $2,000 on a four-wheeler. Someone commented um, about the Suzuki King Quad with the high, low, super low in the front diff lock. That is an awesome bike, the King Quad 300, the King Quad 250, I've had a couple of them. The problem is that engine sits way back here in between the rear wheels. So climbing out of holes, it just wants to flow over backwards. It can't, the front end barely pulls. Um, that little Suzuki is a lot more like a tractor than an ATV, the way it handles and stuff. I love it, but this is a lot, this is a lot more capable. Um, as far as handling goes, this does not handle anywhere near as good as a Rubicon does. The front suspension geometry is just wacky. Yamaha just cannot figure it out. The newer Grizzlies are okay, but the, compared to all the other quads I've had, the Polaris, the Ken Ams, um, of course, tons of Hondas. This thing has some really wacky steering geometry. People also keep saying that I need to do a shim in the pulley um, to change the ratio on the belt drive. I know no one really understands this, and it, I probably need to do a more in-depth video. But basically what the shim does is it lets the belt go deeper into the primary pulley to give you a lower belt ratio, which sounds great, right? Lower ratio, but the problem is if your belt's out here on the pulley, you have this much contact between the pulley and the belt. If your belt's down here, you only have a little bit of contact, so your, your pulley starts to slip on the belt. This belt already slips in reverse. So if I was to do that, it's just gonna slip worse. Those clutch mods like that, the shims, really only work if your belt's not slipping. You're gonna make the belt slip worse. You have less contact between the aluminum and the belt. It's just really, it's not a great way to do a gear reduction. The right way to do a gear reduction is with gears. Now, you can tune the clutch better and put different springs and weights and then do a shim and then you can get some more performance out of it. But just throwing a shim in there, it might feel like it's helping you for a while, but it's eventually gonna lead to increased belt wear. The mod now to make sure I can shift this thing into reverse and out of reverse without having to use two hands. Because when you're in deep water and you're trying to keep it running, um, you need to have one hand there and be able to shift the other hand. So. Uh, the way that works is there's a little pin down there and you see it retracting when I squeeze the rear brake. So all you gotta do is get that little pin out of the way. So there's a bunch of different ways you could do it. All right, so the easiest way to remove that little pin is just to take the nut right there. You can see my finger pointing at it. Back that off a few turns and it'll pull the pin out of the way. So now I can shift through all my gears with one hand. That's a great mod. To get this little knob off, you just pull out this tab and then it slides off. Get this boot off, there's a little wire ring you have to pull off. I just cut it because I don't really care. This is gonna get water in it eventually, I'm sure. Um, so I just cut it off. This little guy impressed me so much yesterday that I decided it deserved a bath. So we wash it with some uh, purple power and uh, now you can actually see the motor. I think I've been cleaning quite a while. Um, but it's, it's all there for the most, most part. Um, so 
things we have to fix on it um, is this back pipe um, where the back pipe comes out of the belt drive exhaust. I had to just make a 180 loop there and apparently that loop was too tight. Once the heat from the engine started flowing across it, it melted a little bit, weakened it, and it ended up getting pinched off like that. So I just cut it this morning to open it up to get some cooling because I realized most of the day yesterday I had no belt cooling. It still worked fine because it's a little tiny Yamaha. So yeah, there's that. Um, also it was underwater a lot and this thing has an aluminum belt box back here. So, you know, I got some heat transfer through there. So he's got a battery here, air box here, and a little storage there for tools. Um, the factory snorkel on the front bolts onto the top of the air box lid and sits there. Uh, it's laying on the ground somewhere. That's what it looks like right there. That's the factory snorkel piece. So you just take that off, put a one and a half inch coupler, flexible spa hose right into the coupler. Um, I put tape around the spa hose. Well, first I filled the grooves in with ultra black and then wrap duct tape around it. And then it just slips in there. It's not even um, clamped or anything, so I can take it apart real easy, but it's nice and watertight. This air box lid is not the best waterproof type air box. And this air box is kind of shallow. So as soon as you get any water in there, it's gonna get the air filter wet. That kind of sucks. Hondas are better about that. Um, a lot of people do this and they come off of the 90 right here and run along the exhaust. So you know this pipe laying on the front. I didn't do that because I don't like my snorkels melting on my exhaust. That's a lot of work. And this really doesn't get in the way. Um, it's just ugly, sure, but you could wrap it with black tape or paint it black and it'd look better. This bike's already hideous, so I don't care. So that's really simple. This is just regular one and a half. They call it spa tube. The inner dammer's a little smaller than that. Um, is it big enough for the motor? Not really. Um, it's a slight reduction in airflow but it seems to run fine even with the stupid CV carburetor. And then it just comes up and zip tied up there. Okay, the next one, the belt intake. This is the easiest one um, from the factory. It's right there. There's a piece of pipe, a two inch coupler fits on it perfectly. Um, you can see how that hose clamp is not in the groove. It's actually lower at the very bottom of it. That's to get the most amount of bite because that, that factory snorkel piece only sticks up that far. I also put some ultra black on that when I put it on there. And then it comes up two hose clamps here, piece of pipe and an elbow. I'd like to make it taller, but that's the piece of pipe I had. I didn't actually buy anything for this. This is all shit I had laying around. Um, so yeah, and that's pretty simple. Okay. This is the belt exhaust. This is a bitch. So we'll start at this end and work our way back. Uh, there's 90 up here to blow the exhaust that way. So I don't have belt stuff hitting me in the face and that heat kind of kind of directed away from me. This is um, a heavier duty spa hose. It's like flexible PVC type stuff. Um, it's a lot stronger. And the reason I had to use it here is because this pipe has to run all the way to the back of the machine under the motor. It would have rubbed, this stuff rubs through really quick. This stuff's a lot stronger. So from there, um, this is just a, a one and a half elbow, one and a half thin wall pipe. It slips in there very nicely. Comes down right behind the radiator. The routing of this is really important, guys. Um, it's zip tied there to keep it from pinching the overflow line from the radiator. Then it will go under here. It comes behind the shock, just barely above the upper control arm. And then I have it zip tied. This is your belt intake snorkel. So it's zip tied to that. And then it runs down here on the side of the engine. This is about the only place you can put it where it doesn't get in the way. Otherwise it gets into the tie rod. Um, it does stick out some. You can see where the tire rubs it a little bit at full lock. Um, that's kind of annoying. Oh, what's going on here? That's why I like these clear hoses. You can see that I've already got some water in my carburetor. Um, that's because the first time I went to go test this, I didn't have the snorkel pipes on and those went under. So I need to blow that line out. Um, good catch there. Okay, we'll get to the vent lines later. So let's keep with this belt exhaust. So you can see it down there. It runs right along the bottom of the motor. It's really tight. I pushed it through there. Um, I hate using flex pipe, but it's about the only way to do these things. It comes out from behind the motor right there. Um, I've got a zip tie to the frame and another zip tie of the frame to hold it up off the upper control arm. Then it makes a loop and goes over the belt box. I could have done a bunch of 90s back there and then saved about a foot. 
but there's plenty of room to make a big loop, so you might as well just do it. Um, and that flows pretty good. So the factory snorkel was up in this area, right in here. Um, so now that that's gone, that's really open. So it does a loop, comes into another piece of thin wall, one and a half, into a 15 degree, or is it a 22.5? I think it's a 15. Um, and then that's the factory boot off the back of the engine. And I said engine, not belt box, because this thing has the belt box cast aluminum into the engine transmission piece. So it's all one piece, very nice watertight belt box. So um, there's where your front one comes off, your front factory intake boot, and the back's this way. I wish they both pointed forward, whatever. That's why you have to make this big loop all the way around. Now, if you know anything about Polaris's, this is very similar to the way the High Lifter 850 is snorkeled. You have the pipe running by your foot right there. Um, so why did I do all this? Well, it's what I had laying around, but it's probably the best way to do it. Um, you could have run it actually through the footwell um, if you're worried about it rubbing on the engine and melting. So we'll see if we end up having some leaks. And if we do, we'll probably run it actually on this side of the plastic. Um, so that's good. Um, what else? So vent lines. Um, there's a lot of vent lines on this thing. Rear diff, you'll find it hanging out right in this area from the factory. Um, this is it right here. And you see I have a coupler on it. So that's where, it, from the factory, it's like up under the gas tank. It's the rear diff. Um, and then the other vent lines here, your car breather. This is the most important one. Um, that's, you don't snorkel that, you're screwed. And then your carb overflow, just go ahead and cap that. Otherwise you'll be getting water in your bowl. Um, and make sure your crankcase breather is hooked up. This is your crankcase breather, it goes to the top of the engine and the air box. It's already in the air box, you don't have to do anything fancy with it, just make sure it's connected. If you remove your air box, always make sure to hook that back up. Um, yeah, that's it for the vent lines here. And then up front, you have the front differential vent line, which is um, up there. So I, I went to clear right here for the, the carburetor vent and the rear diff, because I like to be able to check water in them. Um, so for the factory, you have three vent lines in these little three holes right here. And you can see there's just one there. You have the front diff, the radiator, and your fan. I teed all of those together. So if you look, this line right here has three lines teed into it. Um, it's a T and a T and a T. So that's your front and rear diff and your fan motor. Um, and then this other guy is your fuel vent. So um, this black one is your fuel tank, just goes to the cap. And this clear one is that vent on the carburetor I was just showing you. Um, I did that so it's just a little simpler. Now you have two lines up to here. So the vent lines are pretty simple. That's, that's easy. That's the easy stuff. Um, the hard thing is this, this belt exhaust. Um, now, obviously I made the belt exhaust a lot smaller and a lot longer. So the belt's not going to have as much cooling as it used to. But this thing only has like 25 horsepower. Um, and I think it'll be okay. If you do a Grizzly and you use a one and a half inch pipe, that belt's getting really hot, and I think that's why people have some belt problems with them. Still a better belt drive than most. It's got a wet clutch in there, so the belt's always in constant contact with the pulleys. The pulleys don't let go and grab the belt like a Polaris or a Can-Am. Um, but, yes, I did reduce the flow to the belt and to the engine. Um, this flow didn't really change much. Two-inch pipe's plenty for the intake, but this belt's exhaust is really small under diameter. But, so you got to do it with super belt drive. They're, they're very hard to snorkel. Um... Another mod I did was I got rid of the safety that makes you have to pull the rear brake lever to, or hit the rear brake to put this thing into reverse or park. Um, that's not what you want to be messing with when you're underwater. To delete that, all you got to do is see that nut down there, take that nut, back it off like six turns. That'll pull the little pin back far enough to where it won't interfere. So that's a good mod, um, a must-have mod for going in water. One good thing about carbureted machines is that you can easily adjust your idle and tune it to run better underwater. Um, so I did mess with that a little bit. Another good thing about carbureted machines, you have a thumb choke right here. So if it starts to sputter out underwater, just give a little bit of choke. So that's very nice. Um, yep, yep, yep. So that's all good. Um, and what else was I gonna tell you guys? Uh, to clear the 28s, you have to do some trimming. You can see where I trim there. You can cut that with the razor blade. Um, at full lock, it is pretty close to that snorkel pipe, unfortunately, um, but I haven't really noticed it too much just driving it around. This thing has an excellent front locker. That's the actuator right there. They don't have the flashing 4x4 issue like the Hondas do. 
And uh, the four-wheel drive works really good on this thing. The front lock engages much faster than a Honda, and it, it's um, a little more reliable, like with my other Yamahas anyways. Um, this is a hose I put on the bottom of the air box because the drain's hard to get to. It's way down in there. So this is a hose so I can check my air box easily. I had it in the pond for 10 minutes. Um, belt box was bone dry. Had a few drops come out of my air box. I'm sure they got into the air box cover, um, but that's acceptable. So not too worried about that, but it's a goofy little foiler. Suspension doesn't really, doesn't have much, um, but you know, it still has IRS. So it's got decent clearance and the axle angles aren't bad at all on the front. You could lift the front probably two inches, inch and a half at least. The rear has some pretty good axle angles on it already. So um, all you can really do in the rear is just crank up the preload. But we will test it out tomorrow and see how it does. Um, let me know if you guys have any questions below. Um, yeah, I think that's about it for snorkeling this thing. I am gonna try to put those gears in it. Um, when I get some time, I'll pull the motor and split the case and see if we can gear it down lower. That'll be fun. I'm getting a lot of questions about can you do that with the Gri uh, Grizzly 660 and 700? The answer is no. Um, the, the motor that, that, so that's a totally different transmission than this. And the Grizzly 660, 700 transmission is the same as the Rhino. Um, and the Rhino had 6% lower gears for a few years, but then Yamaha ended up putting those gears in the Grizzly anyway. So the transmission in a Rhino 700, 660, whatever, is the same gear ratios as a Grizzly already. So no, you cannot do this cool gear swap on the big Grizzly. That's why I don't have one. Hey, I wish you could gear those things lower. I'd buy one in a heartbeat. Um, Signal so still has a pull start, but it's got a lot of compression, so it's actually pretty hard to pull it. Um, someone had asked how many miles are on this thing. There, are, it, it's got some miles. Uh, 226 hours and trip A. Let's see how we can change the trip. Oh, these buttons don't work. Uh, 1,050 miles, so got a little bit of miles on her, but the big problem is that it's been left outside, so you know. There's a little bit of corrosion on everything, plastics are faded, etc. And it's definitely been driven into a few trees. You can see how bent up the rack is. Um, you look at that side, and it doesn't match that side. LOL. Uh, so I'm looking for a front rack and, uh, and bumper to put on it. I straightened them out enough to get these bolts in here, but then you can see how weak this thing is. And I had to do that because I wanted to get my snorkel hooked up. So it's, it's really flimsy. Um, I just had to hammer everything to get it all to line up after I took it apart. Yep, yep, yep. So, um, snorkeling is a pain in the butt, but it seems like it's waterproof so far. Hopefully I don't have any issues with the carburetor. If I do, I'll rebuild it, put all new seals in it, and uh, make sure it's 100% watertight. I'm gonna bring a few pieces of PVC with me tomorrow. I know it's wet out in Holopal, so we need to go a little deeper. I'll bring a few pieces I can stick in here to get some more height out of the snorkel.